Okay, so my title is Tonality as Colonizing Force uh, in Africa. Tonality understood as a hierarchically organized system of relations animated by desire accompanied Europe's ostensibly civilizing mission to Africa uh, from the 1800s on, I'm taking it. Church music, anthems and light music for dancing and entertainment enhanced or even defined civic and religious life in communities in Sierra Leone, in Ghana, Togo, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, Zambia, South Africa, and elsewhere. A ready example, perhaps the iconic marker of the kind of tonal thinking exported to Africa is the Protestant Christian hymn. And I've given you a, an example. Um, there's a, a playlist uh, that I think some of you have uh, that has all the examples that I'll be playing today in case you want to follow uh, on and on. Okay, so this hymn, uh, it's my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. You thought you were coming to a talk on African music, but this is where we <laughs> begin. My Jesus, my Someday I would love to do a very detailed hermeneutic analysis of this mode of expression and the kind of reception it has had in various uh, places on the African continent. But that's not my subject today. Uh, this was just an example of a hymn, as I said, the kind of tonal thinking <coughs> exported to Africa. Now, hymns typically came in a standardized four-part texture, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, that no African group had ever used before. I mean, you take it for granted that it's a normal tone of music. Nobody sang like that before. They were clothed in a prosody that few Africans would have recognized, including poetic meters with syllabic counts like 8787 eight, seven, uh, or 111111. These are the number of syllables. So, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. So on, 11 uh, in each. And you'll find very little of that kind of uh, prosody in. Uh, traditional uh, African expression. Hymns displayed a rhyme scheme that is difficult to achieve in indigenous tone languages. And in domesticating hymns whose texts were originally in German or English for local consumption, melodies disregarded the natural declamation of indigenous singing and rode roughshod over the international contours of speech tones. So this is musical violence of a very high order, a violence whose psychic and psychological impact remain to be properly explored by scholars. To be sure, the collective practices associated with the African reception of the Protestant hymn served both colonizer and colonized alike. For the colonizer, they were a means of exerting power and control over native populations by making them speak a tonal language that they had no chance of mastering. A language, moreover, whose reassuring cadences and modest trajectories would prove alluring, have a sedative effect, and keep Africans trapped in a prison house of diatonic tonality. For the colonized, on the other hand, indulging in simple tonal routines was, among other things, a way of realizing an ambition. It was a way of affecting a European manner, speaking a European language, and thereby beginning to acquire some precious accoutrements of modernity, even while securing a place for oneself in heaven. If you sing things like that, you'll go to heaven. Right? Now, the spread of tonality in Africa encompasses a wide variety of musical forms and genres. In urban popular music, from high life to hip life, from Afrobeat to sukus, chord progressions featuring Riemann's three functional classes frequently form the basis of a language in which melodic variation trumped harmonic substitution, and in which the use of indigenous devices such as modal inflection and voice crossing was slow to emerge as an attractive modus operandi for composers. In the realm of art music, itself another direct response to the European heritage, a realm in which self-conscious tonal experimentation was legitimized, black African composers have generally preferred the relative security of closed tonal forms to the uncertainties and insecurities of non-tonal expression. 
Now, understanding the why of these developments would entail looking into a complex of factors, some of them material and economic, some political, and all mediated by the movement of global capital. For it appears that tonality has always followed the movement of global capital. It's interesting that given all the crises that we're talking about today, we should also be looking at uh, what happens to tonality. Uh, but the exportation and importation of tonality are topics too big to be dealt with adequately in a short paper like this. My interest here is in the how of these changes, in the kinds of transformation that one observes on the ground, so to speak. I have come to believe that forms of diatonic harmony and modest, that is to say, phrase-bound tonal trajectories served and continue to serve as powerful agents in the musical colonization of Africa or in the colonization of the musical consciousness of many Africans. We know that the colonial assault on Africa, by which we mean the denial of sovereignty to Africans, but we know that the colonial assault through spoken language, French, English, Portuguese, and religious expression, Islam and Christianity, uh, we know that this uh, assault has already claimed tens of millions of casualties. But relatively little has been said about parallel developments in the area of musical colonization. Now, the discipline that traditionally houses research on African music is ethnomusicology. But ethnomusicology itself is a child of colonialism, a discipline rich in colonial filiation and affiliation. Its research programs, although diverse, are yet to give pride of place to a systematic interrogation of the nature and extent of European influence on African tonal expression. You will not find in Africanist ethnomusicology, by the way, I'm just talking about Africanist ethnomusicology, but not ethnomusicology of the rest of the world, about which I don't know anything. So you can relax. So. You, you will not find in Africanist ethnomusicology the equivalent of Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mass, 1952, or Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized, two works that address the psychological impact of colonial influence in Africa. Indeed, nowadays, the opportunistic embrace of something called hybridity or the transnational or the cosmopolitan, together with an irrational fear of some something called essentialism, have effectively muted or at least discouraged discussion of the transformations in consciousness wrought by the tonal forms exported to Africa. We need therefore to look beyond ethnomusicology, to music theory and to post-colonial theory for the kind of critique that I'm imagining, to music theory for its descriptive and taxonomic tools, and to post-colonial theory for a network of evaluative ethical, aesthetical, and political questioning. My aim in this talk then is, is threefold. First, by means of a simple show and tell strategy, I want to acknowledge a few obvious traces of tonality in Africa. And my examples here come from South Africa and Ghana. Those are the first two on your handout. Then, stepping back from the present, I will remind us of one or two salient features of the imagined sound of pre-colonial Africa, the African soundscape before tonality. And these examples come from Gabon, from Ghana, from the Central African Republic, and from Benin. Third, and returning to the present, I will consider a couple of imaginative responses to European tonality, attempting indirectly to answer the question, what does it mean to compose under a tonal regime? And these examples will come from Nigeria and from Ghana. Now, let me say that this is not intended to be one of those good guy versus bad guy uh, binary arguments, although I don't hide my biases. <laughs> and while I agree with Basil Davidson that, quote, the arrival of Europeans since the early 16th century is the greatest calamity in Africa's history, I think that's essentially correct. I also recognize that colonialism is too complex and profound a historical phenomenon to be reduced to a few local signs or analyzed by means of hasty or knee-jerk reactions, however deeply one feels the issues. I certainly feel them deeply. My aim, rather, is to outline, if you like, a first-level understanding of the dynamics of tonal influence and reception as a stimulus to future research. 
So traces of tonality in African music, two examples. Lady Smith Black Mambazo, an all-male a cappella group from South Africa, has over the years produced a popular repertory that we might say labors under tonal rule. Here's the beginning of their song, Paulina. Paulina, Paulina, uh, somebody is crying for you, you, Paulina, and so on. I'll just play this, and I'm really directing your attention to the harmonies and the tonality. Paulina, Paulina, somebody is crying for you. interesting coming from the hymn that I played you uh, before. So in this, we never leave the home key, the sound of the tonic predominates, and the interstices are weighted towards the subdominant rather than the dominant. One of my undergraduate students pointed out recently that there are no half cadences in this song. And although my initial reaction was to chastise him for listening for absences, for dwelling on what the music lacks instead of what it has, I realized that this is in fact what we all do. All subjective listening is mediated by both presence and absence. Lady Smith have found no use for half cadences. They're yet to invest in that aspect of the expression of tonal desire. Indeed, the same repeating chords and harmonic cycles are made to bear various semantic weights in the expression of text. The same tonic freight accompanies questions like why did you leave him alone, statements like you were nowhere to be found, or entreaties like please Paulina come back to him, and warnings get away from those who want to touch, touch, and kiss, kiss. Of course, the apparent lack of alignment between semantic sense and tonal meaning is not an exception, but rather the rule in the global aesthetics of song. So the Lady Smith guys are not doing anything unusual. Their way of enriching the tonal palette is to invoke a not so distant pentatonic horizon and to hint at the microtonal realm through the use of glissandi on phrases like call you, he loves you, and so on. There are no large trajectories of tonal thought here, just an accumulation of instances of a single progression. But the asymmetry produced by this pattern of repetitions keeps listeners engaged and serves as a guide to the song's message, which is a Christian-tinged or biblical message about what boys do to girls. A simple diatonic bass rules throughout. If we had time, I would play you these examples twice to see if you agree with the description, but we don't. So um, I'll go on to my second example. The second example, um, uh, this is an example also of the reception of tonal harmony, comes from the brass band tradition found throughout the continent and in its diasporic extensions and associated with Protestant churches, with the police and military bands, and various community entertainment groups. Uh, this is the example, your example three, and it's the Peace Brass Band from Ghana playing a hymn that is arranged in high life style. Don't feel constrained in your seats if the spirit's on moves. <laughs> Okay, it goes on. So the harmonic palette here is a little more varied than Lady Smith's. Uh, within a basic diatonic realm, the Peace Brass Band incorporates deceptive as well as perfect cadences. The phrase discourse proceeds in two and four bar blocks. What may sound like infelicities result from the use of the flattened seventh degree in the approach to the final cadence. And you probably uh, heard... Uh, so you got the E flat and the E natural uh, in the approach to that final uh, cadence. Um, uh, these seeming infelicities are strategic. That is, they are uninflected elements in the song's polyphonic system. And regarding voice leading, which is one of the most important uh, points here that I want to make, each of these brass players has grown up speaking a musical language in which parallelism rules in multi-part expression. Here, under the constraints of a four-part hymn, they are, sorry, uh, they are attempting to speak a harmonic language that not only forbids certain parallels, uh, like seconds or fourths or fifths, but abandons uh, even permitted parallels in the approach to cadences. And so the musicians find themselves caught between opposing impulses. The situation is perhaps analogous to the kinds of error that accompany the speaking of a foreign language. 
But whereas in linguistic grammar they are simply called errors, uh, in musical language they are endowed with poetry or are said to be interesting or different. Uh, aestheticizing other people's errors is apparently a favorite metropolitan sport. <laughs> this, this high life hymn is ontologically conceivable only in modern times, that is since the 1840s, only as a product of colonial missionary influence in Ghana. Although bands of wind instruments played throughout the pre-colonial era, and we will indeed hear an example from the Central African Republic later on, none of them utilized functional harmony or the kind of cadential phraseology we heard, or indeed the hierarchic separation between a treble and a bass voice and two inner voices. Now, what is of interest from the point of view of a post-colonial critique is the apparent ease with which these musicians surrender their native musical languages. It would seem that as soon as they were offered a taste of these sorts of cadences and phraseology, they were prepared to give up a part of their tonal harmonic birthright. Well, the question why African musicians seem uneager to resist in the tonal harmonic realm, but not apparently, or at least not to the same extent, in the area of rhythmic behavior is an interesting question. Some would argue that indigenous harmonic systems are not as strong as the invading European ones, but it is hard to sustain that argument if the imposition of tonal rule is accompanied by various forms of material and political control. So these are only two brief examples of tonal production enabled by colonialism. I could have played you th literally thousands more, but the point is made, I think, that certain forms of tonal imagining and expressing became possible only after exposure to European tonal harmony. To the Bible and the gun, and I'm following Basil Davidson, we can now add diatonic tonality as an instrument of colonial domination. The question surely arises, what were Africans doing, tonally or harmonically speaking, before the Europeans came along? Or, as I wrote here, before the Europeans came and spoiled things. So here's African tonal thinking before European colonial takeover. It should come as no surprise that African tonal thinking took many forms before Europeans came along. We catch a tiny glimpse of this in the Reverend A. M. Jones's 1959 book, Studies of African Music. On the basis of field research in Zambia and on close listening to then available recordings, Jones was able to partition the continent according to the intervals preferred by particular ethnic groups in polyphonic performance. Thus, there were the thirds tribes, the sixth tribes, I can't even say it properly, the fourths and fifths tribes, uh, the unison and octave tribes. I think mine was one of the fourths and fifths tribes, by the way. More recently, Gerhard Kubik has assembled a conspectus of African polyphonic behaviors with emphasis on eastern and southern parts of the continent, reminding us of the existence of different sound ideals and especially of the ingenuity with which parts are negotiated. If I say I'm going to review these resources and associated procedures in this uh, talk, uh, I'll be lying because there's simply too much to cover. So let me focus on one particular resource, the so-called anhemitonic pentatonic scale, one of the best known and most widespread tonal constructs found on the African continent. I will later add a piece of drumming to complete this account of pre-colonial resources. So here from Gabon, <coughs> Uh, five Bibayak pygmy voices playing in pentatonic space. Is somewhere like that. Something. And so on. We're 
I can play the rest of it later on if you want. So each singer has internalized the pentatonic horizon and sings her individual part against that horizon, assured that articulating one or two notes, that is a subset of the five note collection, is enough to guarantee the integrity of the resultant pentatonic texture. There are no long-term trajectories in this mode of play, no phrase-generated expectations, no authentic cadences, no archetypal urges of desire and its fulfillment. There is only presentness, the repetition of notes and groups of notes into patterns organized around a palpable pulse. The form emerges additively from an accumulation of nows, a kind of moment form. The aesthetic is minimalistic, and the tonal resource is accepted and treated with reverence, not manipulated with the dubious ethics associated with individual cleverness. If modern artistic production were being guided by this pentatonic practice, it would explore the openness of the resultant sound, give priority to intervals of seconds, fourths, and fifths, embrace a non-teleological uh, temporality, and prefer an egalitarian texture to a hierarchic one. Now, this is, of course, not a prescription for what composers should do, but a little thought experiment about what they would do if they were following certain cultural or communal imperatives. Well, pygmies are not the only exponents of pentatonism in Africa. Closer to my own home are the southern Ewe of Ghana, some of whose vocal music is based on this scale. Here's an example from Joje, and I've taken this from a recording by an American ethnomusicologist called James Burns. And here it is. I'm sorry, I have to tell you what this song is about, because uh, I'm sure you all want to heed its message. There's no need to bluff, however beautiful you are, for there are termites in the ground ready to eat your coffin. <laughs> So as in the Bibayak pygmy example, the pentatonic serves here as a constraining source of pitches. But the Anglo Ewe style is different. For one thing, the initial call response pattern signals a kind of hierarchic organization that the more egalitarian pygmies generally avoid. Uh, even though I found out recently that the Anglo Ewe themselves actually were a chiefless society until they came into contact with the Ashantis. So blame the Ashantis and, <laughs> and so on. Now, each melodic part avails itself of the scale or part thereof, but the voices do not proceed mechanically in parallel. From the singer's point of view, this southern Ewe performing practice privileges linearity over verticality. Sonorities are incidental, except at the ends of phrases where they are supposed to be unison or pure. They are based on the purposeful melodic use of the pentatonic but the polyphonic outcome is known in advance given the referential collection. That is to say that if each singer stays within the pentatonic orbit, then every two note, three note, four note, or five note resultant will conform to the source set. In other words, the pentatonic uh, constitutes a kind of a sound field, a complex sonore subjected to various forms of articulation. Syll Syllable-based articulation in the case of the pygmies who use vocables but not words, and word-based articulation in the case of the Anglo Ewe. The pentatonic, still staying with this, is not of course restricted to vocal music. Instrumental music for horns, trumpets, and xylophones often features a pentatonic reference. And here's an example 
from the repertory of a horn orchestra from the Banda Linda of the Central African uh, Republic. Uh, there are about 18 of these horns playing, and each one of them just plays a single note. And I put this example in here because uh, this is one of the repertories that so fascinated Ligeti and about <coughs> which he writes in the preface to Arom's uh, magnum opus, African Polyphony and Polyrhythm. Um, so uh, here, I'll, I'll play you the example, but just so that you're oriented, the, the, the pentatonic that's being used here is this one, and so on. The tuning is a little different. Uh, it's better than this one. <laughs> so here, here are these horns from the Central African Republic. First, just a big, like a broad gesture to start with, and then the form will begin to unfold. Here we go with it. Stop it. So uh, here is the hocket technique, so beloved of such ensembles. No individual part is meaningful without the others, and this is because only the resultant produces the desired or melody. The collection of horns is playing in a pentatonic sound field. Strictly speaking, there is no hierarchy here, no treble versus bass, although the instruments are assigned different registers so that the total ensemble sound is spread over two and a half octaves. Again, this is music of pre-colonial origins, owing nothing to Europe and everything to black Africa. It's a little hyperbolic. I'm sure you're going to ask me, how do you know? But anyway, <laughs> we will have that discussion later. <laughs> Now consider finally, yeah, this is my last example of the pre-colonial resources. Finally, uh, the following snippet from a different kind of music of pre-European origins, dundum drumming from among the Yoruba uh, of Benin, not Nigeria, Benin. Um, these so-called hourglass drums, um, and every time I use that uh, name hourglass, I can't think of a greater travesty in the naming of our instruments. But anyway, that's what it's come to be. Um, these so-called hourglass drums are noted for their ability to mimic the inflections of spoken language, and in so doing, to explore a wide tonal spectrum. Indeed, the family of dundun drums talks. They are called talking drums. They are mellow rhythmic instruments. But they also mimic talking. That is to say that a given drummer may drum in the speech mode without actually saying anything. While some parts of the musical utterance are oriented towards indefinite rather than definite pitch, we can just about infer, in this example that I'm about to play you, a distant pentatonic horizon. Now, although nowadays the Dundun can sing everything from Amazing Grace to God Save the Queen, uh, its tonal potential is more closely aligned with the complex tonality of, in this case, spoken Yoruba, the Yoruba language. Such a language-based or a language-derived tonality offers a different kind of potential for composers from the imported hymn-based tonality that we heard earlier. So I'll just play a little bit of this dun dun from Benin. <laughs> Stop it. I can't tell you what they're saying because I don't know this language. 
but maybe they're not saying anything. <laughs> okay, well, so, so much for the sound of Africa before the advent of European colonialism. Let, let me be clear about the claim being made here, um, and, and, and namely that the examples three to seven on your list collectively convey some sense of the imagined sound of pre-colonial Africa. The claim is not that <coughs> the techniques and scalar resources enshrined in these examples are unique to Africa. That's not my claim. Pentatonicism, for example, may well be universal, occurring as it does in Africa and Asia and Indonesia and various corners of Europe. Um, but that they were in use in Africa until functional harmony came along and decisively transformed the musical soundscape. Now, functional harmony did not cover every inch of musical surface in Africa, only some of it, notably the coastal regions, urban locations, places with schools, including mission schools, and of course, churches. But these are privileged symbolic sites for interpreting African modernity, that's why I'm dwelling on them, even if they lose out statistically to places without a trace of functional harmony. So it's not about numbers, that's what I'm saying. Okay, and then I come to the final part of my paper. What did colonization make possible? Um, and how has the challenge of post-colonial creativity been handled in specific reference to tonal thinking? I will confine my answer here to two types of music. Um, art music by a Nigerian composer called Joshua Uzoigwe and popular or neo-traditional music by Wulome, uh, a 1970s Ghanaian band. So the peculiar alchemy of an indigenous complex of tonal, rhythmic, and timbral resources inflected or transformed by functional tonality has not lent itself to easy formulation. In terms of compositional practice and aesthetic choice, two options seem to have been favored. The first is a simple grafting of one tonal system onto another. The effect here would be one of strategic indifference to the foreign source, a mode of coexistence, whether peaceful or otherwise. The second is an inflection or transformation of traditional music or its translation into a modern post-colonial economy, drawing upon consciously crafted procedures, some of them borrowed from Europe, others extracted from African traditional music. The whole, however, would be arranged in conformity with the ethical and aesthetical imperatives of indigenous African creativity. These strategies, and there are others of course, are obviously not always localized in a single work, but they offer, I think, a useful vantage point for critical interpretation. So among Joshua Uzoigwe's works, um, Joshua Uzoigwe is not known, uh, but uh, I'll play you some of his music and then you'll decide whether he should remain unknown. Um, but among his works is a set of Igbo songs for voice and piano that blur the line between arrangement and original composition. So although the songs are known in some Igbo communities, Eastern Nigerian communities, as <coughs> folk songs, they have been done up in ways that distance them from their folk origins. They've been defamiliarized, we might say, after their Russian formalists. Listen to the first of these, Eriri Ingaringe, which means a riddle, uh, and the Igbo text uh, in translation is as follows, let it be, let it be, let be the thin thread, the thin thread that lengthened the snake's tail, the thin thread that caused the bird to balance in the air. Uh, the song, as you will hear in a, in a minute, is based on a simple harmonic ostinato which the composer apparently heard in D minor, uh, judging from the tonic solfa that he places above the staff notation in his manuscript. I wanted to impress you by telling you that I've actually seen this manuscript. Um, well, that's what musicologists do, right? Uh, such melodic harmonic cycles, the ostinato that you'll hear, it's something like this. Uh, That's the progression that you will hear. Um, so such uh, melodic harmonic cycles are, of course, common in traditional African music uh, that Uzoigwe knew. So he may simply have sought to remain true to that principle. But let me play you this little snippet. This is Joshua and his then girlfriend uh, performing sometime in the 70s. This is an unpublished uh, recording. Uh, they found some out of tune piano in Lagos, and this is what came out. So I'll play you that. Compose at the piano. Same 
progression. to another stanza. So it's fair, I think, to speak of a transformation of whatever Uzoegwe borrowed from Europe, for he has not allowed himself to be submerged entirely in that tonal world. The specific act of tonal resistance is the simple one of anchoring the expression in folk material, material with its own modal center, which Uzoegwe enriches without violating. The melody is familiar and yet has been defamiliarized, as I said, in this new context. Some listeners will hear something of the sound of drums in the percussive style of piano playing. Those are the essentialists. Uh, this, uh, sorry, I didn't write that. <laughs> and the singer's style, the singer's style is beholden to the presentational forms uh, of the lead, perhaps, or maybe even opera. Um, this music is not conceivable except as a product of the colonial encounter. But unlike the passive acquiescence that we might read into the music of Lady Smith and the Peace Brass Band, the examples I played you near the beginning of my talk, Uzoigwe's Eriri Ngeringe displays an element of struggle, an ideological stance. The hybridity of Uzoigwe's song is marked. It is an earned hybridity, perhaps a hard one one, not a default outcome or one that represents flabby coexistence of opposed elements. Another example uh, from the work of Uzo Egwe, uh, this is one from a set of piano pieces, three piano pieces, collectively known as talking drums. And this is modeled on a traditional Igbo dance, Egu Amala. <coughs> Um, Uzoegwe's approach here is to anchor the work in an African sound field by first using uh, an unusual meter of 19.8, which he maintains is the indigenously felt meter, uh, and then by incorporating a communal performance style involving a lead caller and a group response, uh, and then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly for our purposes, uh, by devising a centric approach to pitch organization in which pentatonic elements are incorporated into a more complex chromatic texture. Uh, and you, uh, I'll play a little bit uh, of that. Let me just say about this dance, this Igbo dance, um, I, I don't know the dance very well, uh, although recently um, a PhD dissertation has been written about it at uh, the University of Pittsburgh by a Catholic nun who uh, actually came and lived with me for three days as we were trying to finish up this thesis. And in that whole time, I really could not hear 19.8. And I don't know how many people hear cycles uh, of 19. I was always sort of hearing some kind of subdivision there. But anyway, Uzo Egwe maintains his 19.8. A Catholic nun, she has a name, but let me just call her that. It's more effective. <laughs> also uh, thinks it's 19.8, but um, who knows? Maybe they're just under colonial influence here. Here's a piano piece, solo piano piece uh, with all those things that I mentioned. <laughs> This is the call, the response, and yeah, this goes on for a while. Okay, I'll stop it, but you get the flavor. Certainly the tonal thinking here is more sophisticated than that which we heard in Lady Smith or in the High Life Hymn. There is more obvious compositional labor here than anything the pygmies do, but that may be the product of musical economics. Uzoigwe's harmonies are paper harmonies, which I will define as harmonies written on paper. I mean, harmonies conceived through acts of inscription. They are at least for Uzoigwe a most productive site for resisting tonalities, colonizing tendencies. The point is that he was never a passive recipient of a European tonal legacy, but sought to re-inscribe everything <coughs> under an African sign. At least that seemed to be the intention. And my final musical example. This is from a Ghanaian band active in the 1970s known as Wulomei. Wulomei in the Ga language means priests. 
This is popular music, or some would call it neo-traditional music. Uh, and the song Soyama has a dance beat, but it is not necessarily meant to be danced to. In some ways, it's contemplative music. Featured, as you'll hear in a minute, uh, are a guitar, various bells and drums, and two <coughs> female voices. And I'll first play you the introduction and the first two melodic verses. In the, intro in the introduction, uh, a clave timeline underlies the solo guitar's rhythmic paraphrase of the melody that is about to be sung. Uh, then the first verse features the two singers in alternation, uh, four bars each. Uh, and in the, in the second verse, they proceed together in parallel, singing thirds and fifths. Uh, there is a critical moment at the end of each verse where a cadence on B flat is sounded. In some ways, this is the linchpin of the song, uh, the key to understanding the colonial element in Soyama, and I'll point that out when we get to it. So this is the last musical example. Ulame. <laughs> Timeline, yeah, pa, 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 pa. I know that, that's the clave. Signal comes in. Second singer. The cadence is here. Together in thirds, yeah. Fifths. Back to a third. Fifth, and so on. The cadence. Okay. So the bundle of attributes that conveys the African essence of Soyama includes a self-satisfied, almost flirtatious beat that both invites and at the same time discourages dancing, the bell ejaculations, the linguistic message, which is he is waving a hand at me, and the drum commentary, which I hope you heard, that was like in a low register there, in speech mode that lies behind the scenes. My particular interest in this song stems from the tonal imagination on display. The chant-like melody uh, itself is modal, perhaps in Phrygian mode. In its initial chant-like appearance, where it is heard in a gentle rhythmic elaboration by the guitar, the mode is clear. The melody proceeds almost exclusively in parallel thirds. I'll play this one again, just so you can verify these things. In verse one, singers give up the guitarist rubato and perform the melody in a relatively strict rhythm. Notice here a series of 5-4-2 punctuations. You'll hear this like that. Um, they just come, and that's all. <laughs> Eventually, you'll get the resolution later. These series of 542 punctuations played by the guitar, they seem obviously, uh, uh, they seem blissfully oblivious to anything else that's going on. Their persistence, however, sets up an expectation for resolution. Uh, and if you are looking for indexical signs in African music, this surely has to be one of them. Confirmation of their meaning comes at the end of the eight bar verse, where they acquire their object, if you like, in the form of a one chord. Talk about desire as a defining feature of tonality. Notable here are the ways in which the composers, uh, Saka Akwe and uh, Ni uh, Ashite, have managed to resist the colonizing force of tonality by using and at the same time undermining it. The 5-1 progression is there, but not simply as a controlling background. If there is a background, it's a more complex one that incorporates the Phrygian elements as well. So if I were to put this in stark binary terms for just rhetorical purposes, I would say that the guitar comes from outside, but what it plays is insider music. Singing in parallel thirds and fifths is the traditional way. 
But whereas singing in thirds dovetails with the European way, Europeans always break the sequence of thirds in order to satisfactorily attain the cadence. I'm talking now about the forms of European music that came to us, not talking about organum or post-1900 uh, music. Yeah? Um, singing in parallel fifths is not the European way, at least not according to the tonal models exported to Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. The net effect of Soyama then is of an imaginative recasting of African and European elements. The colonizing force is contained, is what I want to argue. Semitone tonality is acknowledged, but it does not rule. It is incorporated as one element in a constellation. So I'll just play that last example um, from the beginning again. <coughs> Timeline here. So it's like a free paraphrase of the melody that you're going to hear later on. This is what I'm calling Phrygian. First verse. You can hear Papa, that's the 542 chord. Second singer. Here's the cadence. Together in thirds and so on. Okay, so we heard that. So this, I want to argue, is African music of some imagination, a music that, as critique perhaps, signals what it might mean to relativize and contextualize Europe's tonal legacy. Of course, Soyama is a relatively simple and transparent song, but its compositional structure, I think, inscribes affirmation as well as refusal of the commanding role of European tonality. So to summarize and conclude, it's been my aim in this paper, this is the summary part, uh, just to stimulate discussion of the colonizing role or colonizing potential of forms of tonality exported to Africa, mainly through the Protestant hymn and other Christian music, and to suggest the terms of a post-colonial critique of that role. We proceeded in three stages. First, in order to name the phenomenon, we observed traces of tonal harmony in a song by Lady Smith and in a high life hymn in the Ghanaian brass band tradition. So those were your examples two and three. Then we stepped back and mentioned some ostensibly pre-colonial tonal models, several of them featuring pentatonic, those were your examples four, five, and six, and one of them pointing to the tonality of spoken language, that was your example seven. Finally, we considered a song and part of a piano piece by Nigerian art music composer Joshua Uzoigwe, those were examples eight and nine, and a song in the popular realm by Wulome, uh, example 10. Now, placing a song from the popular repertory last, thereby giving Wulome the last word, was not accidental. Perhaps more than their art music counterparts, composers of popular song have developed more immediately effective ways of resisting some of the coarser ideological impositions brought on by functional tonality. Well, there's obviously a great deal more to say about each of these issues. For example, the handful of traces of tonal thinking we have heard cannot begin to convey the range and diversity in the African response to tonality across numerous genres. And regarding the stock of indigenous resources, there is every indication that we have completely and totally underestimated their range, number, and creative potential. Nevertheless, I hope that these beginnings prove instructive and that they enhance our understanding of tonality as both law and resource, as instrument of control as well as creative language. Tonality has a history outside Europe and peering into that other history may help Euro-Americans see themselves more clearly. Now I thought of ending this paper by telling you that next time you settle into a sumptuous slow movement by Schubert or Brahms, or sing along, as I guess you were doing a few weeks ago, to Handel's Messiah, 
Uh, keep in mind that that language has been used directly as well as indirectly to silence any number of African voices, to cut off their tongues, to cause them to stutter or speak in ways that the metropolis, the metropolis judges as defective. I thought of saying that while violence may not be intrinsic to tonality, it has certainly accompanied tonality's career in Africa. But I didn't want to spoil the enjoyment for you. So as we say in Akbafu, I said it and I said it, but I didn't really say it. Thank you. <laughs>